Okay, so we're going to get started. Today you got two handouts. You got um, assignment or exercise 206, but you also received your handout for assignment 201, which is your first assignment in this class. That means it's bigger, means it requires multiple days worth of skills to all assemble together. Uh, but I'm giving it to you very early. So this isn't due until Monday the 5th of March. So it's about a month. <laughs> so you've got plenty of time to work on this. And the truth is that you're still going to be building skills the whole time. And so things like the pillows that might go on your chair or the cushions that might go on your chair probably won't happen until later on because you don't have the skills to do that yet, which is totally fine. However, there's a lot of this that after today you'll start to have skills that you can start experimenting with. Um, so this is something you want to keep in the, in the back of your head so that you start designing it and thinking about it. Um, by table and chair, so you're modeling both a table and a chair, I mean something you can sit on and something you can put something on. Okay, so it's very loose in its definition. Um, I do want, one of the things that is important about this uh, is how the textures are applied in V-Ray. I'm not expecting there to be any advanced environments, no cloudy skies or anything like that. They can be a generic white background, that's fine. But we want to think about the materials, how they're applied, uh, what they look like when they're, are they appropriate scale, those kinds of things, all of which we'll talk about in depth in the coming weeks. Um, today, you could probably start with some of the basic geometry of the chair. There isn't, um, you could have a very simple chair and do very well on it. You could have a really complicated chair and do poorly on it, depending on how you choose to, to work on it. So it doesn't mean that it has to be super complicated. It just means that it has to be well done and well thought out. Does that make sense? Just want to be clear about that. Um, texture mapping is important. You're going to do three renderings and post all three renderings for this assignment. So don't post one rendering because you're going to get two thirds of the points not there. So we don't want that to happen. So make sure that it is three renderings uh, when we get toward the end. Uh, let's see, what else? Your chair needs to have at least two materials. Um, and the texture mapping should be appropriate. I'm just thinking about what else. Oh, the other thing, um, you don't have to pretend that there's gravity. So, so you know, so some structurally people, you, you, there, there's a number of you that haven't gone far enough in school yet to really understand how structure works or how things are supported. Um, so if you have a certain style of chair that is missing some of the necessary gravitational supports, um, I will be lenient on those kinds of things because I don't expect all of you to understand, you know, the mechanics of structures and, and how that sort of thing works. <laughs> However, you know, you have some common sense about, you know, it shouldn't be just floating there. It should have some kind of a support system, okay? So I'm just saying I'll be a little loose on that. Um, I do want your best image printed on an 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper, so I have a paper record of it. You can give me all three images, but at least one image for each of you. Um, and so, once again, that's due on the 5th of March. So it's a ways off. So you, you get this rather early in this class. It's not quite the turnaround that 135 has, where it's almost every week or two weeks you have an assignment. So this is a little bit, little bit further off. OK, so on with exercise 206. We're going to talk about some different strategies for making things today. But again, this still falls under the very scripted, I'm showing you, this is what you're going to make. These are the tools you're going to make. We will break away from this in the coming weeks to where you'll have to figure out how to make the thing that I'm asking you to make. So it'll get a little bit more uh, flexible as we go forward. So today, we're going to make a little uh, spider clamp that holds a glass wall. And I should probably show you what one looks like. So let me uh, pull up some images here. We're modeling something like this. These little spider clamps, uh, trying to find where it's actually it's very close to something like this. It's a simplified version of this. Uh, the idea here is that we need something that's going to support glass panels uh, in a wall system. I'm just trying to look through and see if I have any other good images of them. Well, you've, you, you've seen enough to get an idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, and so we're going to be able to build a glass curtain wall, essentially, uh, using these pieces. 
So I just wanted to bring that up so that you had some idea of what we were going about uh, making. And I'm going to walk you through how we're going to make it um, here. So first off, we're going to start with some basic um, lines to work from. And I'll, I'll begin this using the arc tool. So I have a couple different options in the arc tool. I have an arc start end and direction at start. That's the one that I use for the door swings. I'm going to instead use the arc uh, center, start, and angle. And so it doesn't really matter where I create this. If I want to be uh, easy on it, I will do I will start at 0 comma 2, or excuse me, 2 comma 0, which would be 2 inches over from the origin. And then my next point would be 0, 0. And then my next point would be an angle of 90, so right to there. I could type in 90, or I can jump to it uh, on screen. So once again, I'm going to use the arc tool. It's the arc center, start, and angle. I'll start at 2, 0. My next point will be either 2 inches over or, or at 0, 0. And then my angle will be at 90. So I create that little arc right like this. If I did it off in space, starting here, I just need to go 2 inches in this direction and then 90 degrees. It's just floating in space. I'm going to delete that. Next piece, I'm going to use my polyline tool. And I'm going to snap to the end of this arc. And I'm going to go over by 13 inches. So I'll type 13 inches. And I'll hit Enter to finish. That gives me that segment. So, so I have the arc followed by the single segment. I need one more arc at the other end. So we'll go back to the center start and angle. I'm going to use my smart tracking this time to go two inches from that end point. I'll snap, and I'll finish. So one more time. Arc, center, start, and angle. Smart tracking. I hover over that end point. I pull down to get my white line. And I say two inches, which gets me back to the base. And then I fold that last piece down. So I end up with this arc, line, arc shape, which is the same shape that you're seeing next to part one in the handout for today. So once I have these three pieces, I'm actually going to join all three pieces together. So I'll select them all and go up to Edit and then Join, or Control-J, or I can type Join. And that gives me just one continuous curve from there. Next, in step two, I'm going to rotate this into three dimensions. So right now it's flat on the ground. And I want it to fold up so that it's in the third dimension. So I'll take the shape. I'll select it. I'll go to Rotate 3D, which is Transform Rotate 3D. Alternatively, I could type Rotate 3D. My start of the rotation axis is going to be right here at the origin. My end will be at the end of my line. My angle is going to be going up the y-axis here. And I'll fold that up until it's standing up on edge. So it's going to look like this, standing up on edge. So let me go back and do that one more time. Rotate 3D. I'll type Rotate 3D this time. Rotate 3D. Select the object to rotate. There it is. I'll hit Enter on the keyboard. I will go along the bottom of this object. My angle is going to be going out the y-axis. And I'll fold it up. Remember, I have ortho turned on, so it's snapping to 90 degrees. If I didn't have ortho turned on, I would need to hold down Shift to make sure it snaps to 90 degrees. Either way. And now I have ortho turned on, and I have my shape up in three-dimensional space like that. At this point, oh, it looks like I flipped step two and three. I joined it before I rotated it. Doesn't matter. Um, I'm going to move on and use the circle tool, which is right. It's the third tool down, circle, center, and radius. And I'm going to 
put a circle at the end of this little arc. So I'll put it right there. Actually, it doesn't matter. Let me do it at the start of the arc here. Right there. And I want, in this case, my diameter to be a half an inch. So don't do it as the radius. So by default, most of the time it says radius up here. We want to make sure that I'm choosing diameter as a value, and that's 0.5. I could do a radius of 0.25 as well, and I'll hit Enter. So I end up with this curve and that little circle. So one more time, let me delete it. I'll go to my circle, third button down on the left. Center of circle is right there. D for diameter, and then 0.5. The, the thing that people typically mess up on is that it's diameter, not radius. So you just want to make sure you're picking a diameter, or you're cutting the the, if you're going to do radius, cut the diameter in half to get the radius. So now I have the arc and I have the circle, and I want to use th those two pieces of geometry to create a tube, a pipe. And so I'm going to use a command called a sweep to create that. And so the sweep command is available under surface, and there's two different options. There's a sweep one, sweep one rail, and a sweep two, or a sweep two rails. And I'll show you what those are in a second. I'll demonstrate both of those. We're going to do a sweep one in this case. The key command for that is sweep one, or you can pick the, the option which is under surface sweep one rail. First thing it asks me for in the command line here is to select the rail. So the rail is this shape. It's the shape along which we want our shape to be made. So there's my rail. Then it says select cross section curve. My cross-section curve is this circle, so I'll select that next. It, I could do more than one, but in this case I only have one, so I'll go ahead and hit Enter. And when I do that, it's going to ask me, where do you want the seam to go? The default is usually fine. So going right there is just fine. I'll hit Enter. And now I get the sweep one rail options, but you can see already that the default options are creating that tube for me. So we're going to leave it as free form, and the rest of these options are fine. I'll say OK. And now, instead of just that curve, I now have a set of objects that makes up this shape. So let me talk a little bit more about sweeps in general. So sweeps essentially allow you to take any cross section and follow along any curve. So in this curve, it was very controlled. It was a two inch radius arc. It's 13 inches straight, and then a 2 inch radius arc. But I don't have to have it that way. Let me turn on, let me create another line over here. Turn off ortho here. I have that shape. It happens to be flat on the ground right now. And if I were to create a cross sectional curve, let me rotate this. Like that. I can sweep this shape along that arc. So let me go back to sweep one. So it's under surface, sweep one rail. That's my rail. That's my cross sectional curve. Enter. There's my seam. Enters my options, and I'll say OK. And so essentially what that did is it, it took the same shape and followed along the curve that I drew on the ground. I could take this a step further in that I can manipulate this shape to no longer be flat on the ground, but instead to have some height. So let's take those. Uh, hold on one second. Vertically, move those up. Move these guys up a little bit. Move vertically. OK, so there's a shape that is no longer flat. And I can take this. I just uh, What I did is I took my curve. I turned on my edit points, which gives me the, the control points for the curve. And then I manipulated those control points, pulled them up and down. 
So now that they're there, I can do the same little sweep. So sweep one, select rail, that's my rail. My cross-sectional curve, there's my cross-sectional curve. Enter, my seam is there, enter. So this one starts to matter with what our style is. So as I look at this shape, you can see that it goes up and it kind of banks into the turn as opposed to maintaining. Do you guys see how that works? And then it comes back down and it, it leans out at that end and it comes back and it leans there. I can change the style from freeform to be road-like top, which is supposed to keep the top flat no matter where you move so that it's always a flat top as you go through. So it's not going to lift up on one side or the other. That's the idea. I say supposed to because it doesn't always work perfectly. We can do road-like front or right to depending on our cross-sectional curve. I'll say okay to finish. And there's my end shape. So you can see I can create a lot of different things from a sweep. So let's say instead, now, I take this and I create another curve inside of this curve. I'm going to look at this from the top view. So that I can draw. OK, so I drew another curve on the inside here. I need to turn on those points again and probably make a few adjustments to some of these so that they more closely mimic the other side of the curve. Anyway, close enough. Now instead of, I've done a sweep one rail, this time I'm going to sweep two rails. So let me go into my surface, and I'm going to choose sweep two rails. In this case, it's going to ask me for the first rail. There's the first rail. Second rail would be right here. Cross-section curve, there's my cross-section curve. And when I hit Enter, there's my seam. It's going to grow the cross-section curve depending on how far apart or how close together the two rails get. So there was a spot in here where the rails got kind of close together, and that creates a smaller little section there. So you can, you can choose how big something is based on how far apart the two pieces are. It'd probably be easier to have two curves that were flat, so you can see them, how, they, how they correspond being flat. So anyway, you don't have to do all of these. I'm just showing you what the sweeps do. Okay? And we'll do some more sweeps. The other thing that's important for you is that this cross-sectional curve doesn't have to join up with where the, the sweep is. So it can be off here in space, and it'll still follow. So let me follow along that with a sweep one. So sweep one, one rail. There's my rail. There's my cross-section curve. And when I hit Enter, it will still follow my curve, but it's offset by the curve because I started my cross-section away from where the curve is. So they don't have to touch. And that's something that people get lost. It's the sweep. Like, no, it has to be the same. It doesn't. You just have to be able to follow it. Okay. So let me, let me delete these, and I'll go back to the shape we were making. I just like to try to illustrate the point of what a sweep does. So I've created this little pipe using that sweep command. It was a sweep one. I'm going to recenter my view by typing Z for zoom, S for selected. And now I'm going to orbit around that object as I work from here. So now that I have this object, I need to create the little buttons on the bottom. So once again, these are, these are uh, in diameter. So I can do a, a curve and then extrude it. I could also go into my solids here and do a cylinder. It's probably a little bit simpler to do a cylinder. I'll go to the center of my cylinder. My diameter this time, I want to make sure that I'm in diameter, which I am. My diameter is 1.5. There it is. And my depth would be negative 0.25 inches, negative quarter inch. So it's going down by a quarter of an inch. 
I need to create the same little button on the other side. Now, of course, I could create this and then mirror it to the other side, but it's good practice for me to show it to you multiple times, so I'm going to draw it again. So I'll go into my primitives again and choose the cylinder. I'll come over to the center. My diameter is 1.5. I'll hit Enter. And my depth here is negative 0.25. There it is. So I have this button and I have that button. Now, what I need to do is I need to create the other half of the button. Let me see if I can do a close-up of one of these images. So we have, we have, I don't know if I can, can zoom in on this at all. No, it's not going to. The way the glass clamps, essentially, there's a hole in the glass, and there's, there's a button on one side and a button on the other side, and the two clamp together to hold the glass. So I need a second little button below the first. So I'm going to copy this one. So I'll go into my transform and then copy. Or I could type copy. The copy is going to happen in the vertical plane. So I'm going to turn on vertical yes, or type V for vertical. Point to copy from would be right there. And I want to go down by 0.75. So I'll type negative 0.75 inches and then enter. And that's leaving between these two objects a half an inch of space for my glass. I think in some of the past lectures I might have done it at 5 eighths. It doesn't matter, but a half inch is a nice round number. So once again, I'll use that copy command over here. So I'll select the, the button. I'll go to Transform and then Copy. I'm going to copy from up here, down, vertically, uh, except I forgot to press vertical, so let me repeat that again. Vertical, yes. Now we're going to go down by 0.75 inches. Oops, how about negative 0.75 inches? There it is. And I'll hit Enter. We'll get rid of this extra one that I made by mistake. So now I have the space for the glass with the two clamps set up. So at this point, I'm going to, uh, I just want to make sure I'm following exactly what you do. Good. OK, I'm going to take this object, and I'm going to rotate it by 45 degrees so it's on a diagonal. So I'll select this. I'm not going to use a Rotate 3D. I'm just going to use a regular Rotate. It'll be Transform and then Rotate. I'm going to snap right to the center, right there. And I'm going to go from, I can hold down Shift so that I jump, from the x-axis up by 45 degrees. So instead of trying to pick where it is, I'm going to actually type 45 and hit Enter. And I know that that's at 45. And lo and behold, it's correct because I designed this so that it would fit on a one inch or one foot by one foot square. So it does fit. Now I need a second copy of this. And there's a couple ways of doing this. First way would be to take my object. I'll copy. It's under Edit Copy. I'll move it over here in space. I'll take the object, and I'll once again do Rotate. And I need to rotate this one. Not by another 45, but actually by 90. So we'll rotate from here, 90. And it's now going the opposite way in the x. I can then take my object, and I can move it. I just type Move. I'm going to snap to the midpoint of the line in the middle. And I'll come over and snap to the midpoint of that line as well, such that the two cross over each other. Now there's another way of doing this that's more efficient. And so as you get better at modeling in Rhino, I want to show you these efficiencies. I'm not expecting you to do it today. I just want to show you that this exists. And that is that when I make my copy, so if I go up to Transform and Copy, or if I type Copy, one of the options is In Place, which means it creates a copy in the same location. So if I click In Place, or type I for In Place, it makes a second copy. Notice that the original is still selected. While that original is still selected, I can type Rotate, go to the middle, and type 90 for 90 degrees. 
and the copy that I created stays right even with my whole figure. So I didn't ever have to move it over and then move it back. I saved myself that time in the modeling process. So it's a little bit more efficient to do it that way. Um, so that was a copy in place and then a rotate to get me to that X. So I think what I'll do, based on where people are, I'll, I'll pause for a little bit. I'll come around and make sure everybody gets to here. And then we'll continue on with the next piece of the, uh, uh, of the, the spider clamp. OK? OK, so a lot of you seem to be cruising right along. So I'm going to do the next part, and then I'll come around and help people that get, get lost along the way. Um, uh, a lot of the next piece I'm leaving up to you to kind of test your knowledge. It's using the same, it's using the same skills that you used before, but I will walk you through it. So first off, um, there, if you flip the drawing over, there's a little drawing on the back that'll help you kind of see what's going on. But what we're going to do is create a rod that is two feet long. And it doesn't matter where I create it. I'm just going to create it over here in space. Let me turn on ortho so that it's straight. And I'll say two feet in that direction. And then enter. This I can then do a circle. The diameter of this is still a half inch. So I'll do 0.5. I'm still on diameter. So 0.5, enter. And I'll rotate 3D this little shape. And there's my circle with my line. I can now do a sweep of this. So I will sweep one. There's my rail. There's my circle. And there's my rod. Now, this is not any different then creating a cylinder on its side. So I can do the same thing, but I need to make sure that this is on its side. So I'll switch my view to initiate the command into the front view, and then I'll come back to the perspective and finish the cylinder. It's the same shape at the end. The only difference is that it has a cap on either end. So you can create it either way. It doesn't matter. Yeah? What? It's the upright little piece. If you look on the back, it's this piece right there. It has a little donut on top. It's the outrigger that supports the cable. OK, so I have that piece drawn or created. And at the end over here, I need to create the little donut that the cable is going to go through. So the cable is 3 eighths of an inch. The outside of the donut is an inch and 3 quarters. So let me do a couple circles to represent that. So I'll start in the center. My outside here was an inch and 3 quarters, so 1.75 inches. I'll do another circle here at the 3 eighths of an inch. So this time my diameter would be 3 eighths, so 0.375, or you could type 3 slash 8 to get 3 eighths. And so I have this and I have that. Now to create the donut that goes around this shape, I need one more circle that goes from this circle to that circle. And so here I'm going to use a special snap, which is called a quad snap, which essentially is like of a circle <laughs> north, south, east, and west. It'll snap to those sides of a circle. So I'll turn on quad snap. And instead of doing my circle center and radius, I'm going to do my circle as a diameter. So it's the second option over here for diameter. And I can now go from that point to that point to create my circle. So I'll do that one more time. The inner one is 3 eighths. Outer one is an inch and 3 quarters. My circle is going to be the diameter circle. My quadrant snap is on. And I will go from there to right there to create that cir third circle. I need to rotate this circle so that it's up in the third dimension. So I'll rotate 3D. So 
Same strategies that we've been doing. There it is. And now I need to do a sweep. And it doesn't matter whether I pick the inside or the outside to do my sweep. So I'll do a sweep one. Surface, sweep one rail. There's my rail. There's my circle. I'll hit Enter. My seam's there. And I'll hit Enter. And it creates that little donut for me. So now I need to do some cleanup because this shape obviously intersects this shape. And so I need to make those trim. So what I'm going to do to make uh, life a little bit easier is I'm going to switch my view. Currently, I'm in the shaded mode so that I can see what's happening in the shaded mode. I'm actually going to switch into the ghosted mode because it's going to let me see through the objects a little bit. And that'll make my trimming process a bit easier. So I'll go up to Edit and then Trim, or I'll type Trim or press Control-T. It says Select Cutting Objects. My cutting object is going to be the donut. I'll hit Enter. Select Object to Trim. I want to trim the end of this object right there. So you see that it cuts it so that the donut goes through. But I actually need to cut it back a little bit further. I need to cut it to that point. So I'm going to click right inside there until I click and trim off that excess. So now that part's trimmed off. I'll hit Enter to finish. And I have the donut nicely on the end. Time to rotate that up into space. So I'll take all of this. I'll rotate 3D. Transform, rotate 3D. And we'll stand it up. And then I have to move it over into space. Now if I look at the dimensions, the um, two feet comes from the surface of the glass, which is at ground, at, which is at zero, at plane zero, but it's right in the center of this. Since this is built on a one foot by one foot grid, I can actually move this from this point to six comma six, and those are absolute coordinates at six inches by six inches, which is the center of this shape. At that point, I have some more trimming to do because this is a little bit long. So let me select these two as my cutting objects. So let me go to Trim, this, and this as my two cutting objects. I'll hit Enter. We'll get rid of that part. And we'll get rid of the parts that are inside this shape, which is good practice. So let me get rid of these poly surfaces there, there, wrong shape. There. And there. So the resulting piece, when I hit Enter, attaches right there. Oops, I missed one little bit. So let me trim and clean that up as well. So I'll hit Enter. And now that's nicely cleaned up, and they meet together. I can switch back into my shaded mode to see it as a solid object. And it meets up nicely there. And I've got my little donut on the top. So all of this looks the way it should. So I'm happy with that. The last piece is I need my 4 foot by 6 foot glass panel. That 4 foot by 6 foot glass panel I can create using the rectangle tool. And one of the important things about glass in Rhino and or V-Ray is that we need two surfaces to represent glass. We need an inside and an outside. So doing it this way is a good strategy. I'll start right at that center point, And I'm going to say at 4 feet, comma, 6 feet. And my thickness is going to be down a half inch. So I'll say negative 0.5 inches. And there it is. It's still a little bit high, though, because I didn't account for that quarter of an inch down. So I need one more move. Move V, oops, select objects. There it is. V for vertical. And it's going to go negative 0.25 to accommodate that little spider there and there. Ultimately, this is going to tile together with a bunch more pieces. So that's why we're building one of them. And then we'll do an array of a bunch of them to create the whole wall. But that's for next class. Uh, I should create the little cable, too. So let me go and create a cylinder. 
it is. I'm going to snap to the center of this shape, so I'll turn on center snap. There it is. I'm going to switch my view into the front view for this so that I can set my diameter. There it is. And then it's going to go up six feet. It would help if I typed negative six feet. No, no, it should have gone, I don't know, somehow I was backwards. Let me just move it by six feet. There we go. And once all these go together, right, the piece will stack on the piece and we'll get all of the, the glass objects. So I have this set up. Now it's time to start applying some materials to this. So we'll go into my V-Ray materials. And I'm going to load a couple different materials. Go into load material. First one is going to be some kind of metal for my clamp. So let me go into V-Ray. And I will say, go into metal. Let's just do steel, steel mat. That'll work. And I'm going to apply that to my clamp. But today, I'm going to, instead of applying it to the clamp directly, I'm going to organize my file just a little bit more. So I have layers over here. I have a default layer. Everything's on the default layer. Let me rename that to be steel. And then layer two, I'll rename to be glass. There it is. And I'm going to move the glass onto the glass layer. So I've selected the glass. I'm right clicking on the glass layer and saying change object layer. And I'll get rid of these other layers because I don't need them. So I have just the steel and the glass. And I'm going to assign my material, go back to my material editor, directly to the layer. So I'll right click on steel mat and say apply material to layer. And it's going to be on the steel layer. Say OK. And then we get to glass. Now for glass, ultimately we're going to have an environment. We're going to have clouds. And we'll be able to reflect the glass. And you'll see it and it'll look like glass. If I were to put glass on this object right now and you were to render it, you would see nothing. Because there's no ambient sky or anything to reflect. So instead, I'm actually going to create a material to look kind of like glass. So I'll right click and say Create Material Standard. And I'll call this uh, Blue Glass. And this blue glass, I'm going to change the color of the material to be kind of a lightish blue, maybe something like that. And I'll say OK. If I were to preview it, there it is. But I'm going to adjust the transparency down to be dark gray. You guys have done this before. And it's going to give me kind of a bluish transparency type material. We can go back and edit it later on. I'm going to right click on blue glass and apply that material to the glass layer. There it is. And then I'll go ahead and stand this up so that it's in the vertical plane. So I'll take all of the object. I'll go to Rotate 3D. I'll rotate around the glass here like that. Then I need an infinite plane. My toolbars aren't showing, so I'm just going to type viz infinite plane. And I'll take the infinite plane, and I'm going to call put it on its own layer. So we'll call that infinite plane. Sorry, I should type it out. Infinite plane. Change object layer. I want to make sure that my infinite plane isn't on the steel or the blue glass, because it's going to look funny if, if we have a big sheet of steel as my infinite plane. My object is a little bit low. Let me move it up. I'll select my object. I did, after I created the infinite plane, I locked the layer so that I can't accidentally move it. It'll allow me to select this. Let me move this. V for vertical so that it's up in space a little bit. Now it's time to do a rendering and see if it turns out. So I'll zoom in a little bit and then render. And I should get a little clamp and a sheet of blue glass. Now obviously this glass isn't real glass, but it's going to be representative of glass for now. 
Um, we will get to glass uh, later on in the semester, I promise. Okay? So this is what we're looking for today. It's all geometry practice. I want you to become very familiar and comfortable with the sweep command. That's the critical one to learn today uh, so that you can move on and use that uh, as part of your assignment one and obviously going forward on a lot of the exercises. So if you find you have extra time after you've created this today, um, please go ahead and start working on your assignment 201. Start thinking about what kind of a chair you want to do. Uh, I, will, I will say one, one little caveat, and that is that I am well aware that there are uh, chairs that are available for free to download online. Believe it or not, I can use the internet too. And so if you choose to use one of those as your own, there's a very good chance that I'll know that you use somebody else's model, in which case you'll get a zero. So don't do that. Model your own chair. There's no reason not to. You are more than capable of doing it, or you will be by the time we get there. So I just want to remind everybody not to, not to do that, OK? Make sense? Good. OK, so post this for your um, exercise 206 today. And then make sure that you save this file, because we're going to use it next class. So do a file save to your Rhino file. Save the 3DM, just like you did with your 205, the bridge from last class, because we'll use it next class. And I'll show you um, how block systems work in Rhino. Uh, 